All right, the year is up, and I would not end the year without one of these for you guys. Here are my top 10 favorite movies of 2011. And like last year, I did not see all the movies that came out this year. So there are going to be a couple of movies where you're going to be like, Dude, what, why isn't that in there? Because this isn't the AFI's top 10 list. It's my top 10 list, and I can only include movies that I've seen. And what's cool is a couple things are going to happen today. I'm going to give you guys a top 10 list, and I'm going to find out who does and does not actually watch my videos based on how shocked people are as to what does and does not make this list. So before you start trolling, actually watch my reviews. So let's get right into it. Number 10. So we're gonna start this list off with a kid's movie, Kung Fu Panda 2. I know, I was actually shocked that this was one of my top 10 favorite movies of 2011, but when I was making my list, I was like, hey, yeah, that deserves to be on there. It's fun for the whole family, it's exciting, it has Gary Oldman as the villain. It upped the stakes from the first movie to the second movie as a sequel should do, but you know, rarely does. Number nine. Coming in at number nine is Thor. Yeah, when I heard they were actually making a Thor movie to set up for the Avengers, I was like, all right, there's gonna be a lot of Marvel movies that are gonna be awesome, and then there's going to be Thor. Turns out Thor is not only great, but it's one of my favorite Avengers movie setups. I mean, it has conflict, it has family, it has science, it has magic, which are the same thing in this movie, which is great. And it has a great villain, Loki, who I can't wait to see in the Avengers. It took a great director to make the concept of these gods relatable for people, and Kenneth Branagh, I salute you. Number eight. All right, people told me that this new Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol movie was actually good, and I laughed in their faces. That's right, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. It had everything that the other Mission Impossible movies should have had, and three came close to having. Third one was good, and then they found their niche and ran with it and made Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. It was a summer movie in the winter. You can't go wrong with that. Number seven. All right, we got another kid's movie, but a kid's movie with the Christmas spirit, Arthur Christmas. When this movie was coming out, I didn't know anything about it. I was like, all right, it's gonna be one of those grade B CGI movies, you know, that's not Disney Pixar, but tries to be. Turns out this was better than the Disney Pixar movie that came out this year. This year had some good animations and Arthur Christmas was my favorite one. It recaptured that spirit of Christmas, you know, that movies these days don't usually do. And it did it really well. Good job, Arthur Christmas. Number six. In fact, for a few of these movies, some of the appeal is the fact that I didn't know if they were going to be good. In fact, I thought they were going to be crap. Take Source Code, for example. I didn't think this movie was going to be good, but it turns out it's intriguing and it's exciting. You watch the same eight minutes pretty much replay for two hours, but it's really cool. Intrigue these days in movies, not that easy to find. It reminded me of an episode of The Outer Limits and they pulled it off for the big screen. Number five. All right, I had high hopes for this movie, and yes, it actually pulled through for me. Warrior. I had heard great things about Warrior. I heard Nick Nolte just kills it in this movie. I heard it's well-directed, it's well-acted, and I heard Tom Hardy is great in it. Turns out all of the above were true statements and facts. Well, opinions, I guess, but you know, facts to me. This is one of those movies that makes you actually wanna like stitch together some relationships within your family. It just is. Two things we can take away from the movie Warrior. Nick Nolte's probably gonna get an Oscar nomination for his role in this movie, and Tom Hardy is gonna kill his bane. Number four. And yes, in 2011, there were a couple of prequel reboot type movies. Take Rise of the Planet of the Apes, for example. Andy Serkis does the motion capture for this movie, and this guy just kills as CGI creatures. He should probably get an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor as Caesar. It probably won't happen, but it should happen. Rise of the Planet of the Apes, you rose to the occasion. Oh! However, I did like X-Men First Class a little more in terms of prequel reboot movie, which is probably a spoiler for number three. Number three. Yeah, I already told you what it was, so let's get right into X-Men First Class. I thought the first two X-Men movies were great, the third one I didn't like, X-Men Origins Wolverine I really didn't like, so I thought X-Men First Class can go either way. If for nothing else, I knew that Michael Fassbender would kill as Magneto, or Eric Lencher, but I had no idea that James McAvoy's portrayal of Professor Charles Xavier would be just as good as Michael Fassbender's Eric Lencher. Turns out both of these great actors were equally good, the movie was great, and it was exciting. And it had Kevin Bacon as a villain, seriously, come on. This is one of those movies that I'll go a while without watching, and then I'll watch it again and be like, why don't I watch this a lot more? X-Men First Class, you get number three. Now, when it comes down to the top two movies of a top 10 list like this, it can pretty much interchange. But for my top 10 list, this is how it played out. Number two. Coming in at number two is 50-50. This is one of those Oscar contender type movies that I heard was an Oscar contender and immediately I was like, I probably won't like it, I'm just saying. Turns out I more than liked it, I loved it. Joseph Gordon-Levitt was great in the movie, he should probably get an Oscar nomination too. His relationship with his therapist was really cute, it was really well done, and the movie makes you reflect as to how life changes in your eyes after you're diagnosed with cancer, like how do you deal with that? This is a heartfelt movie, anyone who watches this movie could probably relate to it and love it. Number one. 
All right, coming in at number one, this is a big decision here. Let's soak this in. Like I said, number one and two can probably interchange, but as I have it, number one is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part two. I'm a huge fan of the Harry Potter books, so I'm not just picking this as a fanboy or anything like that. In fact, the Harry Potter movies as they are, I have a problem with because they're not that loyal to the books, but this movie just really killed it off perfectly. There were a couple of things I would have liked to have seen or liked to have seen them done differently, but in the end, this is the stance that good takes against evil. This is good versus evil, old school, and it's done done really, really well. I've seen this movie a few times and I could watch it a few more times. And for me, that's saying a lot. I usually don't rewatch movies that much. So if I watch a movie a few times, that means it deserves number one. Great hero, great villain, great themes, you know, a friendship, honor, loyalty, all that good stuff that, you know, the old Star Wars trilogy was all about and then somehow wasn't with the prequels. All right, so that is my top 10 list of 2011. So what's your top 10 list of 2011? Make a video and put it as a video response. Or if you just like to type, comment below, let me know. And yes, for every best list is a worst list. My top 10 worst movies of 2011, it's coming soon. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen here and you want to see more, click right here to see more. Even if you didn't agree with some of my picks. Opinions and all that makes the world go round.